Welcome back to the sharing section. Uh, in this section, the topic will be why Rust might change things for the better. And the guest speaker is Utash Guo uh, from Clearbot Hong Kong. Uh, he has been in Hong Kong since 2016 and graduated from the University of Hong Kong with a degree in computer science in 2020. He started building Clearbot's self-driving robot boats that clean the oceans in 2019 and also works on building tools for developers such as DeployFi and has worked on several open source projects in the past. Please. All right, um, excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, thanks for the introduction. It's all good, right? Yeah, cool. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Yeah, nice. Um, so uh, as my introduction says, uh, I'm a startup founder. I've been in Hong Kong since 2016. Uh, now I'm doing uh, a bunch of robotics and machine learning. And recently I've been experimenting with Rust. Um, it's uh, it sort of brings some new excitement into, into a world of somebody who's just been doing web development or C++ Java programming. And it brings some, some interesting um, concepts, some interesting programming patterns that I wanted to share with everybody today. Um, before I get started, uh, not part of the Rust Foundation or Rust project in any way, shape, or form. Um, so what this talk is going to cover, uh, I just want to give you a heads up on things that we are going to talk about today. So firstly, if you've not heard of Rust before, hey, Rust is a programming language. We're going to talk a little bit about it. Um, then we're going to walk through what's there to love, why, why I love the programming language, and, and what, what, what are the different kind of projects that I've used it for. And maybe we'll walk through some code examples. So I'll try and code. That's why I've got this mic set up. Thank you so much to the team here who's got the mic set up for me here. <clears throat> uh, what I'm not trying to do is sort of ask you to ditch whatever programming language you're using and move to Rust because Rust is great. I'm not trying to do that. It's just a tool at the end of the day, right? And don't take any of the code that I have on my slides today as tutorials. They're purely trying to convey some kind of idea, some kind of concepts in the programming language, and not necessarily the, the best tutorials out there to implement things. Um, and there's a whole World Wide Web for you to look for tutorials for, for Rust. <clears throat> so um, if you've not heard of Rust, again, uh, this is how Rust defines itself on, on the website. It's a, it's a reliable, uh, it's a language that can help you build reliable and efficient software. I believe the, the stress is on both reliable and efficient because Rust is both um, sort of reliable in the, in, the, in the more traditional sense where things don't break as often, compiler is quite safe, things, things are sort of, you're warned of, of certain kind of problems in your code beforehand. And it's efficient because it still runs fast. Right, and uh, you'll see the, the different kind of benchmarking and stuff in my in my presentation later. <clears throat> so um, I'm not the only one alone, right? Uh, that's that's banging the sort of drums about, hey, uh, Rust is great. Uh, there's this is the Stack Overflow uh, survey that shows that out of all the people who are voting in the survey, 86%. Uh, love Rust versus the 13% who, who, who don't like it, right? And, and so I'm not the only one here who's, and I'm not one-sidedly trying to tell you that, that you know, Rust is great. Uh, it's something you could look into. Hopefully, I'm giving you an introduction to it today. <clears throat> so since there are two words that are being stressed on quite a bit, uh, reliability and efficiency, we're just going to look at them individually and maybe run through some of the examples to to try and understand it better. Uh, so I think, I think it's pretty late in the afternoon. We're trying to wake the very few people who are here already in the audience. So who here recognizes the programming language for this code? This is, I hope everybody's clear. It's, yeah, C++, right? So this is C++, right? Um, now, my second question to that is, uh, does this program compile? Uh, 
I can promise that there are no landmines in terms of, oh, I'm missing a semicolon, or I've put a weird character that, that will make the compiler dislike my program in any way, right? Just purely from a, I can assure you that it's syntactically great, but do you think this code will compile? I'm getting a few nods. So I can, I, can, I can sort of go ahead and say that, yes, this code will compile. But my second question, my follow-up to that is, do you think this code will run? Any guesses? It's a little different, but, but let me also open the terminal while I'm at it. You don't have to just believe me, right? It compiles. Right. You don't have to blindly believe me on that. But yes, my next question is, does this run? Um, well, yes, it doesn't. But I don't want to put you on the spot. But if you can give me like a one to two phrases of why it doesn't. That, that's a pretty good spot, right? So let's, let's go back here. Um, again, let, let's, uh, to give you, by the way, if you've, if you've not done C++, I'm sorry, let me give you a walk down on what this code is doing. Essentially, it's starting out by creating a cat pointer. Um, it's assigned to null at the moment. And uh, this solution function is, is a sort of, uh, I, I like to think of it when I'm imagining it's like a very stubborn function which doesn't return the solution, but rather wants to put it inside the pointer so that the, wherever this pointer is coming back from, wherever this pointer, whenever this pointer comes back, it comes back with a value, right? So, and the solution is nothing, it's just uh, imagine any key. Let's say instead of A, uh, the key is Z instead, right? So it doesn't matter. And, and it's going to be happy all the way till here, where it's going to assign the value of, well, let's, let's mind the language. It is going to assign a reference to this variable, the key, uh, to this pointer p, right? That means the pointer is sort of going to point towards the key, right? And if you try to ask, you know, what the value of, of key is, uh, or, or so the value of p is, it's going to come back with z, at least for, for the first time, right? But uh, what's going to happen here? is that the key that was declared in the solution function is going to go out of scope, right? And then the compiler is not going to, the runtime is not going to like it because it's going to say that that memory is not accessible anymore and it's, and it's going to sort of flip on you. So let's try and see this, right? So it, it throws something called a segmentation fault. It's a runtime error. It's quite ugly. You don't want it in your code. Right, so a little bit of appreciation of of why the segmentation fault happens and why we want to avoid it. First, look at the comparison in Rust. Rust goes all ballistic on you when you try to do something similar, right? And that's where the reliability, at least the first part of reliability that I absolutely love, comes in. Uh, for those who have not seen Rust, you're probably confused on what's happening here. Right? There's a lot of stuff on the screen. Rust is really not happy. So given that you can see this example, allow me to break this down for you in the next, let's say, five to 10 minutes. And by the end of it, you'll come out understanding why Rust is like this, right? And why is it complaining? But to give you a, a look at the code itself, so this is Rust samples. Right? You'll see what C++ complained about, that the key is, what C++ didn't com complain about, that the key is dropped, Rust complains. Right? It says that the key does not live long enough. Right? So, so what does this mean, and, and, and why does Rust complain? Let's, let's kind of look into it. 
It comes down to this concept called references and borrowing in Rust, right? That's not, that's not existent um, in, in C++, well, the checks for it, right? So to explain to you first the very basic fundamentals, let's take a real world scenario, all right? There are two people, there's Alice and there's Bob. This kind of example is very, it's, you'll, you'll relate to it if you've studied in school and borrowed your pencil to a classmate, right? So similarly here, uh, Alice has a pencil, and Bob requests Alice for, for the pencil for the class, just, just for that one hour class time, right? So Alice says, okay, please return it to me once you're done, right? <clears throat> so when something is borrowed, when you borrow something from someone, you kind of return it back, right? Because if you don't, then the original owner cannot use it, right? That's, that's how it works in the real world. But Bob can be two kinds of Bob. Bob can be a good Bob, right, who borrows the pencil for his work and then returns it back, all right? But then Bob can be an evil Bob. Bob takes the pencil and then never gives it back to Alice, right? And Alice wants to use it for the next class. Alice cannot do that because Bob has the pencil. And Bob is evil Bob. He's run away with the pencil, right? So let's have a look at, at an example for that. I'll just sort of make it out here. Yeah. Let's say we call this function. Okay. Give the pencil. All right. And I mean, we can create a pencil struct and things like that, but we're going to try and keep it as simple as possible. So let's call it just a string for now, right? Right? And then I'm just going to simply print out of that. Uh, I'd, I'd just urge you to ignore syntax in case you've not done Rust before. But I hope that the code itself is, is pretty explanatory. Right? And for now, let's just delete the stuff. Right. Let's pencil. Right. String. No. Or let's just call it from. Again, this is just how strings are declared in Rust, and I'll just let, let you ignore it in case you've not seen it before. But all right, so this is giving the pencil to, to let's say, this is just like a function, Alice giving the pencil to Bob, right? And uh, the similar sort of scenario to my example before is that let's say there's this variable pencil, right, which is analogous to the physical pencil, and it's being given to somebody here to this function, give, give the pencil, right? And this is not going to work, so I'm just going to delete that. And I'm going to... All right. Cool. Um, and after, after the pencil is sort of, I'm so sorry. I made a silly mistake here. I'm going to run behind a little bit. I'm going to try and code faster. All right, let's say pencil is P, and we're going to code faster this time, right?
All right. Sorry for that mistake. Uh, but essentially, what's happening here is yes. So the solution function is giving the pencil, and um, p here is the actual pencil. So in Rust, when you're trying to pass a variable to a function, right? Um, the fu if you pass it to a function and the function does not borrow it, but instead takes ownership of it, which it is doing here, right? Um, again, the syntax of ownership means that it's just not taking a reference. Instead, it's just taking the variable directly itself. You will see that Rust complains. It says that p has been moved into the function. And the function has taken the ownership. This is just like evil Bob, right? It's not going to return the, uh, the, the pencil back. And if he doesn't return the pencil back, then we can't use it here, right? But instead, if this was just a borrow, you'll see that the code is happy. And that's because when you're borrowing a certain variable to the function, Rust knows that once the function is done with that variable, the ownership is going to come back to, well, in our case, Alice, or the, 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 the original scope of the actual variable. Right? So this kind of ownership protects a lot of these issues that you saw in the segmentation fault earlier. Right? And that's one of the reasons why Rust is a lot safer than, let's say, C++. Right? <clears throat> so. Sorry for the confusion, but I hope that this was clear. Um, beyond that, again, as I said, I want to explore what are the different kind of things that are there to love in Rust, right? Uh, there's something called enums in Rust, which you must have seen in other programming languages like JavaScript and Python as well. But compared to enums in JavaScript and Python, the ones in, in Rust make a lot of sense. And maybe I can show you a little bit more on what I mean. this time without making a mistake. All right. So you can see a enum, uh, a enum here in Rust. It's defined very similar to what you would see in JavaScript, right? where you can give it a certain key here, like I have an enum of type animal. An animal can be either a dog or a cat, and it can make and you can, sorry, and you can create variables of that type of enum, right? But enums can do a lot more in Rust than they can do in Python or JavaScript. For example, you can implement functions on an enum, just like you can implement functions on classes in Python or 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 for that matter, in, uh, in JavaScript. Right? You can have an enum have some kind of functionality, like make sound. And then, based on whether it's a dog or a cat, you can make it do different things. Right? And structs are just like, just like your classes. Right? You, they can have different functions, which are called, again, implements in, in Rust. And you can have them um, have sort of their constructors as well as their respective functions. Right, but to really make you appreciate what enums can do, right? Let's look at this one. All right, let's ignore this for now. Right, this is a Python enum, right? And when um, when you create an animal, let's say we're trying to make an animal sound of either a cat or a dog, which this function helps us do, right? you can pass, let's say, that cat. And what the code is going to give out is it's going to print out meow. right? But let's say I, later on in our code, we added a, a rabbit. right? But we didn't handle that case here. But we did this, where we tried to make the animal sound of rabbit. Does anyone know what Python would do in this scenario? Speak. 
It's actually just not going to do anything, right? It's not even going to complain. It's not even going to be an error. Uh, even though you've completely skipped on and implementing uh, something for this, this field, right? Uh, that's something that Rust completely avoids. So I've kind of written this code down before earlier. But let's take a look at just the make animal sound for now, right? All right. And in this make animal sound, instead of a rabbit, I'm going to have a tiger here. But essentially, if I did not handle that case, Rust is not going to let me compile. And that's because it says that the well equivalent to if else, which is a match statement here in Rust, is not covering all the different uh, cases of the enum. Right? And so this way, enum becomes really, really useful. Right? It's in fact so useful that Rust uses enums for error handling as well. You'll see here that I have something called a result type. Right? This result is, in fact, an enum in Rust. Right? And it's very similar to Golang, if you've seen Golang before, where um, functions return a, a value and an error. And if there's an error, you kind of handle the error first. And if there's no error, then the rest of your code can run. So that's sort of the programming pattern in Go, which is kind of verbose where you have to handle the error there and then itself. Right? But in Rust, what you can do is you can handle these errors, uh, and you can store these errors into, into variables, into enums, essentially. Right? And how that's done is you basically define what's your data type for when you're trying to return a value, and what's your error type in the second, in the second uh, field. And what you, what you get back from, let's say, a function like pet, I'm just going to delete this for now, is something called a result type as well. Sorry, just. So this, is, this comes back as a result type, right? And in this result type itself, you'll see that first is your data type, the string type. Um, and obviously, for a tiger, it's going to come back saying, it's an error. It's, it's a don't pet a tiger. Uh, but for, let's say, a dog and cat, it's going to come back with the sounds, right? Um, but the error is actually contained in the second part of the enum. So how that works is you'll see that For example, here, right? Uh, you can destructure the enum, sort of destructure it, where you can say that if it came back with a value, its value is OK, right? And whatever the data is inside, you can print that data out. And the second match that you can do is for if that enum had an error. This, is, this should remind you a little bit of Golang if you've done it, where you can check for if error, then, then print out error. If data, then print out data. That's basically what's happening here. But in case I don't handle the error, whoops. In case I don't handle the error, Rust is going to be really upset with me. Because very similar to enums that we saw before, where um, the animal had, had an additional field, uh, here the enum has an additional field called error that we are not handling. right? So just adding that back sort of gets the program happy again. Right? <clears throat> so I hope you can appreciate a little bit of why Rust enums are great. Um, maybe I can run this for you. And Right? So even though it was an error, don't pet a tiger, you know, uh, it sort of prints out and handles the error gracefully. Um, to give you an example where this can go really, really bad, um, let's take an example of JavaScript, I guess. Um, 
and hopefully that will help you appreciate this a little bit more. Um, JavaScript, not here. I think this was here, right? So what happens when, when this error handling is not as good as it is in Rust, right? I think, I think we've done enough JavaScript. I myself have done enough JavaScript during web development. And we, so we many a times come across these kind of functions, right? There, there's like function one that's calling function two, that's calling function three. Here, buzz is calling bar, and bar is calling foo. And error is happening in any one of them. And we don't absolutely know why, because these errors get thrown around rather than stored as a variable and, and, and accessible that way. So, what ends up happening is, essentially, the error gets thrown somewhere here in foo, but actually bar is expected to return in a zero, let's say, right? And, and then we are wanting to console log our data. And obviously, here you can see that this function is small and nice. So you can see that, OK, there's going to be an error. When the project becomes bigger and bigger, and these nestings for error handlings become deeper and deeper, you don't know where the error is kind of coming from, and then you never know how to handle it. You don't even know where to handle it. Do you want to handle it here in this function? Or do you want to handle it here? right? Or do you want to handle it here? Or do you want to handle it all the way outside, like here? Right? That's obviously the kind of ambiguities that, that start coming in because, because of the way the errors are being thrown around. Okay. So things are more type driven, as I like to put it, right? For when they're, they're more type driven for the better, I feel, right? That's obviously my opinion, but uh, I feel like if things are more type driven, at least uh, there's more certainty and there's better API design that can happen around, uh, uh, around these, these kind of code bases. <clears throat> Don't have a lot of time to get through structures and traits, uh, but um, just like enums, uh, structs and traits sort of help Rust uh, become more sort of type driven right you can you can design apis here not in the main, not in the sense of web apis but rather in the sense of uh, system apis like for example if you're building a library or something like that right and you can you can design your library's api to have better uh, type safety things like that uh, next part is efficiency uh, i'm going to again go through it very quickly but uh, there are some sort of benchmarks online that you can go on and see that Rust does really, really well. Uh, the only thing I can really do here is tell you that Rust, well, runs very fast, right? Uh, there are some YouTube videos on there that, that will show you that runs, uh, runs blazingly fast, as, as the primogen likes to put it, right? And he compares it with Python and TypeScript and stuff like that. You can have a look later as well. Um, but great benchmarks are not everything, um, right? You need to be able to make something with Rust. And you can't simply rewrite things in Rust so, so they work well. But there are some examples out there. Uh, there are backend servers. And there are different kind of web pages that you can make in Rust. Maybe I can just quickly sort of sneak in one thing, which is um, this is a web server written in Rust that does socket socket handling, right? And, uh, sorry, yeah. And uh, just to go through the syntax a little bit, it just simply starts a TCP listener, you'll see on line six, and then uh, starts accepting connections, and, and, and every time it re receives the data, it just echoes it back, right? Uh, point here is not to teach you again how to make this and things like that, but show you that it is possible, right? Uh, similarly, it's possible to actually spin up a web page in Rust as well. Uh, maybe I could just show it to you. Yeah. This is wonderful names. This is a web page that's completely written in Rust. It's very simple, but it has Tailwind and stuff put in along with the VASM, right? And or I've deployed this Docker image here that, that has the web server that we just wrote. 
and it's just echoing back on and off as we send the messages. Uh, something that I intended to do is uh, bring a sort of electronics demo here to, to show you sort of an embedded systems in Rust, but that's where things start to get a little ugly, while Rust promises a lot of embedded systems development at the moment. Um, it's not completely ready yet. And that's sort of the last part of my talk, which is uh, that Rust is, again, just a tool. And the, while the ecosystem is developing, there's still a lot of scope for improvement. There are places where you can use it to your advantage. And there are places that Rust just doesn't work. Right? Um, one of the places where it works, and we are doing something, is uh, building a Python library. They're there on GitHub. Um, github.com slash deployfy slash meteorite. We are building a web server in Rust. Um, you can have a look at it. And uh, we obviously welcome contributions. We want somebody to do Python typing on it and things like that, so we are welcoming contributors. Um, these are my handles if you want to get in touch with me. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I've run a little bit over the time. But yeah, thank you so much for listening. Questions? Yeah. Um, so I know there was a meme about one does not simply rewrite in Rust, but is that true? And why is that so? That's a good question. I'll try to keep it brief. Essentially, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's, that you can write in JavaScript in terms of web development that's very, very simple to write in JavaScript than in Rust. So here's a simple three to four line WebSocket server here if you wrote it in Python, but it's longer in Rust, right? And obviously, there are a lot of more complicated, um, let's put it non-beginner friendly concepts that you kind of have to keep in mind while developing in Rust. Right, so this is purely to show you that you can't simply go out and start building things in Rust. You kind of have to understand a little bit of the fundamentals of the language. Things are um, a little more difficult than other programming languages when you're trying to do different kind of tasks. But obviously, for some things, Rust is going to be simpler. For some things, it's going to be way harder. Right, uh, and and the code for, by the way, the web page and and this are on the on GitHub. You can have a look. Uh, the web page is absolutely unnecessarily long for no reason, but it, it, it works. It works pretty well, but it's unnecessarily long. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Uchkas, for the sharing.